everyone, I'm Bree Price. I'm the Extension Coordinator with the Washington State University Honeybee and Pollinators Program. We're here today at the WSU Puyallup Demonstration Garden. We invited Tira McKelvey from Rent Mason Bees today. Tira, can you tell me a little bit about your company? Yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for having us. Um, it's a huge honor to be able to teach more people about solitary bees, especially our native Blue Orchard Mason Bee. Um, Rent Mason Bees is the largest solitary bee provider in the country. We uh, harvest and clean three million Mason Bees every season. And you're not, re you're not renting a bee, you're releasing bees and you're renting the nesting material that we then harvest and clean for you. And so today, I'm really excited to teach everyone how to care for solitary bees, what they are, and what we can do moving forward to make a huge impact for their population. Tira, can you explain what a solitary bee is? Sure, yeah. So not a lot of people know what solitary bees are. Everyone knows what a honeybee is. Honeybees have a queen, they have a hive, they're called a social bee. A solitary bee means that each female lays all her own eggs, finds her own food, and finds her own nest. And so 90% of bees are solitary, which is a huge staggering statistic that most of our bees are solitary bees. The Blue Orchard Mason Bee is the native species for the Pacific Northwest area. Really, really important to care for these little bees. A lot of people mistake them for a housefly because they have this green iridescent sheen on their body. Um, some of the kids call them mermaid bees because they really do look like a little iridescent mermaid tail. So they're amazing little pollinators. Um, they have little hairs on their belly called scopa, S-C-O-P-A, scopa, and they belly flop onto the flowers and they get completely covered in loose pollen. And what makes that so amazing is that loose pollen then gets sprinkled everywhere around their garden and they pollinate 95% of everything they land on. I'm interested in learning more about how honeybee life cycles being social insects mm -hmm. is different than mason bees being solitary. Yeah, that's a really great point. So they spin a silk cocoon and they hibernate in that cocoon all winter long and they emerge six to nine months later when temperatures reach about 50 degrees. Each female mason bee will crawl into a hole and she'll cap it with mud and then she'll gather pollen and she'll put a, make a pollen loaf for her baby and then she'll lay a tiny little egg and then she'll cap it with mud. And in each hole she'll cap it at the very end with mud so there could be five to sometimes 13, 14 babies in each little nesting chamber. Oh, wow. And then the mason bees will emerge and they'll crawl out of that hole. It took us two years to film the life cycle of a mason bee. So we're gonna transition and we're gonna show you this amazing video and then we'll come back to you and teach you the proper nesting material, how to care for these bees and uh, what you can do to make an impact in their um, population.
wasn't that video incredible? Um, I love showing that video and teaching people because it really gives you the visual of how these little bees are in there making their nesting chambers. And then you transition to the predators that can really harm your mason bees. So you can see when you saw the cells of the mason bee inside the cell spinning its cocoon and then uh, how the pollen mites and the chalk brood and the Houdini fly completely can take over those nesting chambers. So now I want to teach you the proper nesting material to use for your solitary bees. We work with a lot of bee labs and uh, bee research teams across the country that uh, validate and back up all of this information that we're sharing today. Um, we have some demonstrations on the table today of the bad nesting material that you don't want to use for mason bees. You cannot use logs with holes drilled in it. Um, these are impossible to clean. You can never open these and clean these and over time these will become a predator habitat because you saw the pollen mites. They just multiply rapidly. Um, there are so many bee hotels sold all over the country, millions of them, mm -hmm. but there are never any instructions on how to clean these. Mm -hmm. So people think that they can just leave them out year round. Well, these are super glued to these little bee houses. They're really cute houses, but you can't ever clean them or harvest them. Um, so there's three really key components when you're hosting mason bees. The first one is that you're using the right nesting material. So the proper nesting material are stacking trays that you can pull apart and clean. Um, or cardboard tubes that you can unravel and roll at the end of the season. Um, the second component is that at the end of spring, you're gonna be removing all that nesting material and storing them. And so there's no predators in the summertime that are gonna bother them. And then the third step is in the fall, you're gonna harvest and clean everything. But I wanted to show you today because we did bring some really fun examples to show you. So not proper versus proper. Um, this is a very common bee hotel that people um, we'll use in transition. So as you can see, again, car, these are bamboo. They're super glued to the back of this house. Um, you cannot get to these to clean. So if you see these in a the garden, please start transitioning to the correct nesting material. This is another um, bee hotel that a lot of people have. Um, again, you, you can see the mold that's piled up in here. All these, all these bamboo um, are moldy and black, which is gonna kill the mason bee. But there was a segment of this bee house, if you have a similar one, that had a stacking tray in the middle of it. So there's a stacking tray and then bamboo. Well, this has screws, so we unscrewed to pull this out. So I wanted to show you the inside of a mason bee nesting cell. Examining our bees today, we've noticed that uh, again, every season this happens, we have so many pollen mites. So these are little pollen mites. And a lot of people love to host their own mason bees. And if you do, it's so important to harvest and clean. Because what happens in the spring when this, this is a fully grown, well, the bee will emerge from this little cocoon and he'll crawl or she or he will crawl through the chamber, through the pollen mites out to get out. And as it crawls through, these little pollen mites will stick to the back and it will eventually kill the bee and then also spread pollen mites all over the flowers. Um, the other thing that we're noticing are the Houdini fly larvae. And again, these guys will stay here all winter long and they will emerge with the mason bees in the springtime as well. And they eat the pollen loaf that the mason bee left for its baby. And then the, the Houdini fly larvae will then eat all of it and it will kill the mason bee. And you can see here, these were little baby mason bee larvae that have chalk brood and fungus on them that has killed them. So it is it's so important to harvest and clean all of your mason bee cocoons every fall. I know I mention it over and over again, but it's just so important to reiterate. Okay, so I'd love to teach everyone how to convert from not good nesting material. So bamboo or logs with holes drilled in it. How do you get your mason bees out? Because there's baby bees in there. When you see a cute little bee house and there's all these mud plugs, there's babies in there. Mm -hmm. And so how do we get these little babies to move homes? And so I want to teach you a couple of really easy methods to do that. You can just stick things in um, a clear container because uh, I want to be able to see what emerges. Very nicely tuck them away in there. Early spring is when they're going to start emerging. When you see them emerge, just open the lid, let them out, and then quickly put the lid back on. They're going to want to go back in. You don't want them to go back into this old nesting material. The other method is just using tool. So you can take some tool. You can take your cute little bee house. You can wrap it up. You can stick it with the holes upright. That's fine. You just wrap it up. 
and then just get a rubber band or whatever and then just seal it up or you know close it up and then when the bees emerge from here you'll simply open this very gently because there's little bees in there let them fly away and then close it back up again so they don't go back in and nest. Somewhere within five to 10 feet of where you're releasing these bees, um, set out a, a bee hotel uh, with, the, with the proper uh, nesting material so that they will go back into the healthy stuff so that you can keep the process and harvest and clean everything. Okay, so now that people can understand how to transition from these old bamboo or wood block nests to stacking trays or the correct nesting material, what should they do in the spring to help the bees? In early spring, there's not a lot blooming. So you need to make sure that your garden or your home has a lot of early spring blooms. Um, I know not a lot of people like dandelions, but dandelions is a bee's first food. When you see a dandelion pop up, that's the time where those spring pollinators are also starting to emerge. The other important steps are to make sure that you hang your house on a flat surface. So the side of a house, a shed, or a fence post will work great. And you wanna hang it in early morning sun. Remember these are spring pollinators. So it's still frosty and cold at night and then they're waking up and they need to be in that early morning sun to mid afternoon sun. Um, so take a look in your yard to see what, uh, where the sun's hitting first thing in the morning and that's a good spot to hang your house. You'll also wanna hang it about five to six feet off the ground. You're gonna to wanna to see your bees work. So make sure you're able to see your bees. If you have little kids, you can hang it a little bit lower, but a good good, good amount is about five to six feet. And then you're gonna to wanna to provide a mud source for your bees about five to 15 feet from their nesting site. And you need to make sure the mud source is clean. Remember that mama mason bee, she's gonna be using that mud to make her mud pollen baby mud caps inside the nesting chambers. So whatever you're using in your yard, your soil, all of that will seep into the ground and can harm developing larvae and mason bees. Uh, so if you take care and do those steps in spring, you will have a great habitat for your bees. It's really important to remove that nesting material at the end of spring and you just store it in a cool garage or shed. It doesn't need to be temperature controlled. You can wrap it up in tool again if you want so that you can uh, avoid any predators getting in. But in the summertime we have mono wasps which are a really bad uh, predator. They have uh, they are the size of a fruit fly and they have this long ovipositor, ovipositor. It's not a stinger, it's like this long ovipositor on the back and she gets into your nesting chambers. She pokes a hole into the cocoon and she lays her babies inside that cocoon. And those are really bad predators that we see in the summer. So in spring, the best way to care for your bees is to put out new correct nesting material and provide them early blooming flowers so they have food. Yep. And then in summer, blocking off uh, the nest from any predators, such as using tool or putting mm -hmm. it in your garage, protecting them from predators. Yep. What do you do in the fall? So in the fall, once the mason bees have spun their silk cocoons, that's when it's safe to harvest and clean. So typically in September, October, November, those cocoons are hardy and waterproof. So when we mean harvest your cocoons, that essentially just means you're opening up your nesting material and you're um, scraping out your stacking trays and you just get a bin and you we use a little pen with a, a soft tip on it a cap and we scrape the trays uh, all the nesting material into the trays and we collect all the pollen mites all the chalk brood all the houdini fly and healthy cocoons it's just a big mosh of all this dirty stuff at the same time you can then get your cardboard tubes and you can open those up and clean uh, all of the contents in there. Then you'll have this big bin full of dirty mud, predators, all of that, that then you go to the next stage of giving them a bee bath in a very, very mild bleach solution. And then you'll set them out to dry because you don't want them to get moldy. And then you'll put them in winter hibernation in your refrigerator in a humidity controlled little box. And so we have a lot of different ways of teaching you that if you're interested in visiting our YouTube channel, there's a great video on how to harvest and clean your own bees. And we do a step-by-step -step guide on how to do that. I notice in that picture, there's a step for sterilizing the nest. What does that look like? Yeah. So 
So when you sterilize your stacking trays, you have to use flame to burn off any uh, pollen mites that linger and chalk brood. So chalk brood is a fungus. It's a spore that bees collect on flowers and they'll take it back in and they'll lay it next to that baby mason bee and the mason, mason bee baby will eat it ingest that spore and then it uh, it essentially dries it out from the inside well then that all those spores will burst and multiply within that nesting chamber and the only way you can get rid of the little tiny microscopic fungus spores of chalk brood is to sterilize with a flame and if you have un tubes to unravel and clean you're not going to reuse those you're just going to throw those away and the next spring you're going to place clean nesting material out and you're going to give them a fresh start every spring so yeah so we've covered a lot of material today what would you say is the best take-home message for viewers we would just summarize it um, you know if you just remember the three important steps to raising and hosting solitary mason bees um, the first one is to place clean nesting material out every spring and you want to use the nesting material that you can open and clean so stacking trays or cardboard tubes the second is they don't stay out year round those nests have to come down at the very end of spring and then you store them in a cool garage or shed and then third step is that you have to harvest and clean all the predators and get your little bees to safety so that they're going to emerge nice and healthy the following spring and you'll put them on uh, in hibernation in the refrigerator so if you can take away anything today those are the three most important things that's how we can shift and change the way people are currently raising mason bees by leaving them out year round and using the wrong nesting material it's time to make a change and it's time to save these little bee populations so yeah, thank you. Tira, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, I really appreciate the opportunity to teach more people about these incredible Blue Orchard native mason bees. Um, and I know there's a lot that we covered today. And if, uh, if people are interested in not worrying about the harvesting and the cleaning and the predators and touching all the little grimy stuff um, you can rent through our program where uh, you can visit our website rentmasonbees.com and we uh, sell stacking trays with bees so you're not renting the bees you're releasing bees and renting the nesting material this is our large stacking tray this is our smaller one and each tube will come with about 60 cocoons these bees have already emerged, so they're empty. Um, but you'll, it's super easy to set up. You just take your bee house, you hang it up uh, about five to six feet off the ground in a nice sunny spot, and you place your bee house in the, the nesting block inside. You take the tube, you place it on top, and they will emerge, and it's nice and easy. So you're releasing the bees, and then you'll just mail this nesting block back to us in September. And remember what we learned, this block's gotta come out at the end of spring and you'll store it in a cool garage or shed until it's time to mail back to us. So that's how our program works and we just really appreciate this opportunity to teach more people about our little solitary bees. So thank you for having me. Mm -hmm.